بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا. Welcome everyone back uh, to our reading of this great book, the Book of the Shifa by Qadi Ayad rahimahullah. So we're going to begin inshallah today chapter two. قال المصنف رحمه الله ونفعنا بعلومه في الدارين آمين. So Qadi Ayad, he says, may Allah have mercy on him and may we benefit. From his knowledge in the two abodes, inshallah. Chapter two Allah's perfecting his good qualities of character and constitution and giving him all the virtues of the deen and this world. So, by character and constitution, he means that the Prophet's perfection was in his character, his character traits, and his also physical constitution, how he physically looked, the physical aspects of, of him. And as we know, this is one of the unique features of the Prophet ﷺ is that we have these very, very intimate and very, very accurate and detailed descriptions of his physical features, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whoever loves the noble Prophet, peace be upon him, and is searching out the complete details of the inestimable treasure of his being should know that man's beautiful and perfect qualities can be placed in one or two categories. Number one, characteristics which are innate and a necessary part of the life of this world, such as natural form of things connected to the necessary act of daily life. And number two, characteristics which are required as part of the deen. These are things for which one is praised and which bring one near to Allah. The quality, these qualities can be further divided into two categories. Quality, number one, qualities which are either purely innate or acquired. And number two, qualities which combine both elements. Man has no choice in or ability to acquire innate qualities. These include things like perfection of physique, physical beauty, strength of intellect, soundness of understanding, eloquence of tongue, acuteness of the senses, strength of limb, balance, nobility of lineage, the might of one's people, and the honor of one's land. So these innate qualities, these are things that we would say like when we talk amongst ourselves, like Qadr with a capital Q, there, there are things that Allah Ta'ala has caused us to be born with, and we have no control over them. Also connected to this are the things that are necessary of necessities of daily life, such as food, sleep, clothes, dwelling place, marriage, property, and rank. These things, however, can be connected to the next world, if the intention in them is related to fear of Allah and teaching the body to follow the path of Allah, in spite of the fact that they are all defined as necessities and governed by the rules of the Sharia. So these, what we would call dunya things, these worldly things, they're worldly, but if we have an intention in us engaging in them, that it connects us to the hereafter, then we are rewarded for them. As for the acquired Things which pertain to the next world, they include all virtues and adab or character traits of the Sharia. Things such as practice of the deen, knowledge, forbearance, patience, thankfulness, justice, doing without, humility, pardon, chastity, generosity, courage, modesty, manliness, silence, deliberation, gravity, mercy, good manners, comradeship, and other similar qualities, they can be summed up as good character. Some of these qualities can be part of natural instinct and basic disposition in some people. Others do not have them and have to acquire them. However, some basic rudiments of them must exist in a person's natural disposition as Allah willing, we will make clear. Even when the face of, even when the face of Allah in the next world is not what is intended by these worldly qualities, they are still considered good character and virtues according to the consensus held by men of sound intellect However, there is a disagreement as to the reason for people having these qualities. Right? So he's talking about, he's trying to lay out the map. These are the different type of qualities that people can have. Sometimes you're born with things. Sometimes you acquire things. Sometimes you have things that help you for this world. Sometimes you have things that are required for our religious life or our deen life. And he's going to show us how the Prophet وسلم, has the best of all of these qualities. Section one. If someone has been blessed with even one or two of these qualities of perfection and nobility, 
whether lineage, beauty, power, knowledge, forbearance, courage, or generosity, he is considered noteworthy, and people use him as an example. People's heartfelt esteem of these qualities make people who have them honored long after their bones have turned to dust. So these are the type of people that we would we refer to historically as great people that have done great things. When you come and analyze them, if we made like a chart of all of these qualities, they have a few of these qualities. And it's it, those few qualities that they have in abundance are what led them to be great. So what then can be said of the inestimable worth of someone who possesses all of these qualities in such abundance that they cannot be counted or expressed in words? Now, the great people that I mentioned just a moment ago, oftentimes it's very common that we say, we look at the flaws of the great people. So we talk about great leaders, great warriors, great thinkers, uh, great inventors. But when you analyze their personal life, we would find that there are many deficiencies. There are many aspects of their lives that were not good. However, in the case of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the 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 over I mean he's you know full marks and everything, and that's why for us he's an example. But why in the modern world, oftentimes it's almost too good for people to to believe or understand, because they've never contemplated somebody having that type. Of perfection. It would be impossible for such a person who had all of these qualities to have gained them either by graft or guile. So you, you can't fake all of that. Such a thing is only possible by the gift of Allah the Almighty. They include prophethood, bearing the message, close friendship with Allah, Allah's love, being chosen, the night journey, the vision of Allah, nearness, proximity, revelation, intercession, mediation, all the virtues, high degree, the praiseworthy station, the buraq, the ascension, the ma'raj, being sent to all mankind, leading the prophets in prayer, the witnessing for him of the prophets and their communities, mastery over the descendants of Adam, his being the bearer of the banner of praise, bringing good news and warning, his place with the one with the throne, obedience, bearing the trust, guidance, being a mercy for the worlds, Allah's being blessed with him so that he is allowed to ask of him, the kawthar, having listened to the perfection of blessing on him, pardon for past and future wrong actions, the expanding of his breast and removing of his burden, the elevation of his renown, his being helped by a mighty victory. These are all, by the way, phrases that are taken from the Quran that describe the Prophet Sallallahu the sending down of the Sakina, Allah's sort of quietness and gentleness upon them during battle, support by the angels, his bringing the book of wisdom, the seven Mathani, and the immense Quran. The seven Mathani is one of the words of the Quran, or one of the names, sorry, of the Quran, rather. His community being purified, his calling to Allah, the prayer of Allah and the angels on him, his judging between people by what Allah showed him, his removing the chains and burden from them, Allah swearing by his name, his supplication being answered, inanimate objects and animals speaking to him, the dead being brought back to life for his sake, the deaf hearing, water gushing from between his fingers, his turning a little into a lot, the splitting of the moon, the sun going back, his changing of the essence of things, his being helped by terror, his He's being held by terror. He's been given victory through terror. It's a hadith in which one of the unique qualities is that he was being given victory by people being uh, frightened, even by the, the thought of going into battle with him. His knowing the unseen, the cloud shading him, the glorification of the pebbles in his hands, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his removing pain, his protection from people, and so on. And this is just some of what Allah gave him. There is much more. Knowledge of his qualities can only be contained by someone who was given it, and only Allah can bestow it. There is no God but him. Add to all this the stations of honor, degrees of purity, ranks of happiness, ex excellence and increase, which Allah has prepared for him in the domain of the next world, which cannot be numbered, which intellects are unable to grasp, and which confound the imagination.
So that's a huge list. <laughs> and all of these are things that we use to describe the Prophet ﷺ in both the Qur'an and the Hadith uh, liter literature. So he's bringing them all together, you know, in just this little introduction to show you all of these and much, much more are the, is the definition of the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّكَ لَا عَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Indeed, you are upon a vast character. Section two, his physical attributes. There's absolutely no way to conceal the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu is the worthiest of all mankind, the greatest of them in position and most perfect of them in good qualities and virtue. I am setting out to detail his qualities of perfection in the best way I can, which has filled me with longing to call attention to some of his attributes. May Allah Ta'ala grant him and give him peace. No, may Allah illuminate my heart and yours and increase my love and your love for this noble Prophet Sallallahu That if you were to look into all the qualities of perfection, which cannot be acquired. So he's, he's talking about the, the things that you're born with and which are part of one's constitution. You will find that the Prophet Sallallahu has every one of them. All of them various good qualities without there being any dispute about it amongst the transmitters of the tradition. The beauty of his physical form and the perfect proportion of his limbs are related in numerous sound and famous traditions from Imam Ali alayhi salam, Anas ibn Malik, Abu Huraira, al bara ibn Azib, Aish alayhi salam, Ibn Abi Hala, Abu Juhayfa. Uh, one second. Juhayfa, Abu Juhayfa. Jabir ibn Samura, Umm Ma'bad ibn Abbas, Mu'arid ibn Mu'ayqib, Abu Thufayl al-Ida. No, Abu Thufayl and al-Adda ibn Khalid, Quraym ibn Fatik, Hakim ibn Hizam and others. These are the narrations of the physical characteristics of the Prophet Sallallahu what we refer to as al-Hilya. Al-Hilya is the descriptions, those people that, that describe the physical appearance of the Prophet Sallallahu And it is uh, common uh, that the Hilya be written in a, in a beautiful uh, calligraphic way. And many homes and masajid would have the Hilya. We have a beautiful one in our own mosque, alhamdulillah, that somebody donated to us. Um, and it's... it's uh, it's one of the unique features of the Prophet ﷺ that he has been described in this way. Now, what's interesting is that many of the Sahaba didn't describe the Prophet ﷺ because they were so overwhelmed by his beauty and by his greatness that they would be embarrassed to look at him for so long. Uh, so most of the companions, you know, they wouldn't sit sit there staring at the Prophet Asad but there are some who did and, and who described him. So he's going to now narrate for us some of these physical qualities. He had the most radiant coloring, deep black eyes, which were wide set and had a sort of red tint to them. He had long eyelashes, a bright complexion an aquiline nose, and a gap between his front teeth. His face was round with a wide brow. He had a thick beard which reached his chest. His chest and abdomen were of equal size, meaning that he was properly proportioned. He was broad-chested with broad shoulders. He had large bones, large arms, thick palms and soles, long fingers, fair skin, and fine hair from the chest to the navel. He was neither tall nor short, but between the two. In spite of that, no tall person who walked with the Prophet seemed taller than him. His hair was neither curly nor straight. When he laughed and his teeth showed, it was like a flash of lightning, or they seemed as white as hailstones. When he spoke, it was like 
light issuing from between his teeth. He had a well-formed neck, neither broad nor fat. He had a compact body, which was not fleshy. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Barra said, I did not see anyone with a more beautiful lock of hair resting on a red robe than the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Huraira said, I have not seen anything more beautiful than the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was as if the sun was shining in his face. When he laughed, it reflected from the wall. Jabir ibn Samura radiallahu anhu was asked, was his face like a sword? And he replied, no, it was like the sun and the moon. It was round. In her description, Umm Ma'bad said, from afar, he was the most beautiful of people. And close up, he was the most handsome. Ibn Abi Hala said, his face shone like the full moon. At the end of his description, Imam Ali alayhi salam said, anyone who saw him suddenly, was filled with awe of him, and those who kept his company loved him. So, not so. It's 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 a unique thing that if you see him just for a fleeting moment, even that fleeting moment would have an impact on you. You wouldn't you wouldn't forget him. You wouldn't think that oh, this is an average person. Even if you just sort of were. You know, your eyes were going like this over a group of people and you saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you would be filled with awe just in seeing him. And if you lived with him and interacted with him, you would have fallen in love with him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All do, who described him said they had not seen anyone like him either before or since. There are many famous hadith which describe the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We will not take the time here to give them all. We have restricted ourselves to some aspects of his description and given a summary of them, which is enough to serve our purpose. You will find, Allah willing, that we have concluded these, these sections with a hadith which combines all these things. Okay, section three, his cleanliness. The complete cleanliness of his body, the sweetness of his smell and perspiration and his freedom from uncleanliness and bodily defects comprises a special quality given to him by Allah, which no one else enjoys. And these were made yet more complete by the cleanliness dictated by the Sharia and the 10 practices of natural behavior, al-fitra. Now, what he means is that every aspect of the Prophet's physical self, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was beautiful and clean. In other words, in our belief, in our a'taqad of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we do not believe that there is any aspect of him that is unclean. Even the things that come out of the Prophet's body, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are considered to be clean, which is a unique thing because obviously nobody has that quality. So he was so pure, his physical self, and he was so clean that even his sweat smelled like musk. And there are hadith that some people would gather his sweat and mix it with their fragrances and wear that as their own fragrance. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's intense. That's, a, that's another level of, of beauty. You know, nobody's sweat smells good, right? After somebody sweats for too long, it'll smell good. Except the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. And that's why this book is so important, because we're, he's going to tell you, there's nothing that he's going to leave. This book is, is a complete book in describing the perfection of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, sometimes Muslims in the modern world, when they hear stuff like this, they have they feel uncomfortable or they've never heard this before, which is why we're doing this this book because it's so important because these are standard these are standard articles of belief. He's not saying anything that's weird. This is actually what all of the ulama say and all of our sources say. Okay, returning to the text, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the deen is based on cleanliness. So 
in another hadith, the Prophet said, Taharatu shatrul iman, that cleanliness, purity is half of faith. And that's why we, we really need to up our game when it comes to this issue of cleanliness. So um, a Muslim, because of our belief and because of our following the way of the Prophet, we are meant to be clean. Physically, here I'm talking here about physically clean. And the spaces that we occupy need to be physically clean. And we need to go, you, you know, there should be this extra emphasis on cleanliness, that the mosque should never be dirty. The bathroom of the mosque should never be dirty, which means that when we ourselves go to use the bathroom or to make wudu or something like that, we need to leave that place clean. The way we put our shoes or our sandals or our slippers and we enter the mosque, the way we dress, the way we smell, the way we are put together, the Muslim is meant to be a, a model of cleanliness. So this is very, very uh, important. I thought I knew what clean was until I went to Japan. When I went to Japan, it redefined the possibilities of, of cleanliness, mashallah. And I said, I have not smelled amber, musk, or anything more fragrant than the smell of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm sure you've been to a perfume store before, uh, or a cosmetic store, or sometimes there are uh, stores, actually, I, I remember I discovered this, that they create their own scent that they spray in the store and outside of the store to attract people to come into the store. So when the when the the door of the you know that store opens, you're like your your gush, your there's a rush of smell. It's just a very nice smell. Like, oh, it kind of makes you happy and you, you want to walk in. All of that, anything that you've ever smelled, the Prophet Sasan smelled better than that in his natural way. Jabir ibn Samara said that the Messenger of Allah Sassim touched his cheek and he said, I felt a cool sensation and his hand was scented. It was as if he had taken it from a bag of perfume. The Prophet Sassim touched this person's cheek just like that. I mean, have you ever he heard anyone describe the sensation of someone's touch upon you? Maybe we've, we hear like a tender touch a loving touch, but, but to this level of detail, he touched my cheek, I said, I felt a cool sensation. So there's this transference of, of this coolness and his hands were scented. It was as if he had taken it from a bag of perfume, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone else asked, no matter whether he had put scent on his hand or not, if he shook a man's hand, the fragrance would remain for the whole day. So if you shook the Prophet's hand, وسلم, your hand would smell like that for the rest of the day. If the Prophet وسلم, placed his hand on the head of a child, that child could be recognized amongst the other children because of the fragrance. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, slept on a rug in the house of Anas and he perspired. So when the Prophet وسلم, was taking a nap, he, he started to sweat. Anas' mother brought a long-necked bottle in which to put his sweat. The Messenger of Allah asked her about this, and she said, we put it in our perfume, and it is the most fragrant of scents. In his great history, Al-Bukhari, Al-Bukhari has an, other books other than his Sahih collection. So he has a book called At-Tariq Al-Kabir, which he's translating as the great history. Al-Bukhari mentioned that Jabir said, when the Prophet Sassam went down a road, Anyone who followed him knew that he had passed away because of his scent. Ishaq ibn Rahway mentioned that the Prophet's fragrance occurred without the use of perfume. Okay, and so this is our belief that this was his natural scent, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Muzani and Al-Harbi relate that Jabir said, the Prophet sallallahu let me ride behind him. So I put my mouth on the seal of prophethood and it spread over me like musk. So he was behind the Prophet Sallallahu you know, on a, on a riding animal. And we know that behind the Prophet Sallallahu the heart, you know, behind his shoulder blades, close to the left shoulder blade, there was the seal of the Prophet. So here he's holding on to the Prophet Sallallahu riding behind him, and his mouth came 
to the back, to the Prophet's back, alayhi salatu salam. Most likely on top of the Prophet's clothes. So he's saying, I did that. And then the smell of the Prophet, his, this radiant smell spread all over my body. One of the scholars concerned with reports about the Prophet and his qualities related that when he wanted to defecate, the earth split open and swallowed up his feces and urine and it gave off a fragrant smell. This is what I was mentioning in the beginning. So this is one of his unique qualities, what we call al-qasais, that when he would relieve himself, alayhi salatu salam, the earth would swallow that, there would be no effect that you would not see that or would not remain. And even still, that which came out of him was fragrant. So it was of a different nature, of a different quality altogether. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad ibn Sa'ad, uh, Sa'ad al-Waqidi scribe related that I, Sayyidah Aisha alayhi salam said to the Prophet sallam, when you come from relieving yourself, we do not see anything nauseous from you. And he said, Aisha, do you not know that the earth swallows up what comes out of the prophets so that none of it is seen? I mean, there's nobody in history who, who's been described of what, what, what going to the bathroom was like for them. We just assume everyone uses the bathroom, which is part of human nature. And he goes and he comes back and he's more radiant than, than, you know, than, than he was before, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Although this tradition is not famous, the people of knowledge still mention the purity of his feces and urine. This is a issue of consensus. This is not like some kind of weird position. This is a standard position. One of the companions, he means this tradition that he just read by its narration might not be as popular, but this issue, this belief, point of belief is standard. One of the companions of Imam al-Shafi'i radiallahu anhu stated that Imam Abu Nasr al sabbagh related it in his collection. Scholars relate both of the preceding statements. Abu Bakr ibn Sabiq al-Makki included in them in his book Al-Badiyah about the branches of Maliki fiqh, which outlines those things which are not part of their school and come from the secondary judgments of the Shafi'is. The point is that nothing objectionable or unpleasant came from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Connected on this, we have the hadith of Imam Ali alayhi salam. I washed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and I began to look for what is normally found in a corpse. He means when he washed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi after he passed, the ghusl. And he says, I began to look for what is normally found in a corpse, but I did not find anything. So I said, you were pure in life and pure in death. Tipta mayyatan wa hayyan ya Rasulullah. He added a sweet smell came from him whose like I have never experienced. So usually when we wash the body after a person passes, usually we place the body on a table that's slightly inverted, inclined like this, and then we press on the, on the stomach, on the abdomen, on the left side, to release anything, any feces or anything that might be remaining in the colon. This is normal. It's just a normal thing. And then after we do that, and then the reason we put the body on the angle so that it can slide out, then we do the ghusl and wash the body. So he's saying, I was looking for that. You know, that's normal. We wash the bodies all the time. This happens. He said, he, I, not only did I not find that, but then I started to smell the radiant scent of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu kissed the Prophet after his death, he said something to the same effect. So that took the uh, how, how beautiful you are in, in life and in death is also attributed to Imam, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, after he realized that the Prophet had passed, والسلام, he went and he kissed him on his forehead. Sallallahu alayhi wa there was also the time when Malik ibn Sinan drank his blood on the day of Uhud and licked it up. The Prophet وسلم, allowed him to do that and then he said the fire will not touch you because the Prophet وسلم, was injured. And uh, I mean the way it's translated it sounds <laughs> different, Drink, drank his blood. But I mean it's from in the narration of the story because the Prophet وسلم, was injured, tooth was injured. And blood 
is considered najis, is considered ritually impure in the Sharia. So this again is one of his unique qualities, alayhi salatu salam. Something similar occurred when Abdullah bin Zubair drank his cupped blood. The cupping of the hijama, you know, when you put the cupping on the back and some slits are made and excess blood is taken, it's a practice. Uh, it's called cupping and it's now like in vogue among some people. Um, I lost my place. So Abdullah bin Zubair drank his cup blood. The Prophet said, woe to you from the people and woe to the people from you. But he did not object to what he had done. Something similar is related about when a woman drank some of his urine by accident, that, that is. He told her, you will never complain of a stomach ache. So the Prophet had relieved himself at night in like a basin and she did not know. I think she came into the room and did not know what that was. She thought it was water because it didn't smell bad. It didn't smell like urine, and she drank it. And uh, of course, this was not done on purpose. He did not order any of them to wash their mouths out, nor did he forbid them to do it again. So this is Qadi Ayad showing you the legal understanding of these narrations means that that which comes out of the Prophet itself is pure. It's not najis like it is for us. Now, of course, you know, modern people will, will read this and, you know, they'll laugh at us and, you know, and they, you know, they can laugh at us now and then we'll see who's laughing Yom Al-Qiyamah, inshallah. The hadith of women drinking the urine is sound. ad dar Qutni, who's a famous hadith scholar, follows Muslim and Al-Bukhari who re related and is sahih. So ad dar Qutni, he has a, his own collection of hadith. The name of this woman was Baraka but they disagree about her lineage. Some say that it was Umm Ayman who used to serve the Prophet ﷺ. I know it is Umm Ayman, Baraka, that's, I, need, I would need to review that. But anyway, she said that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu had a wooden cup which he placed under his bed in which he would urinate during the night. One night he urinated in it and when he examined it in the morning, there was nothing in it. He asked Baraka about that and she said, I got up and felt thirsty so I drank it without knowing. This hadith is related by Ibn Juraj and others. The Prophet ﷺ was born circumcised with his umbilical cord cut. So in the story of the Milad, of the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, these, these are the other narrations that we found, find, which further emphasizes his purity and his uniqueness. It was related that his mother, Sayyida Amin salam, said he was born clean. There was no impurity on him. If you've ever been at the birth of a child, you'll know that when the child comes out, there's a lot of gook on them, you know, <laughs> from, from that process. And they have to be, they're wiped down and cleansed. But the Prophet ﷺ was not born like that. Sayyidah Aish alayhi salam said, I never saw the private parts of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa which is another one of his unique qualities, is that even uh, something as intimate as his relations with his wives, they still did not see his privates, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Imam Ali alayhi salam said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa asked me to make sure that no one except me washed him. And he said, no one has seen me naked without going blind. So of course, when you wash the body, you cover the face and the privates. And you wash the body over that. Uh, you don't expose the private parts. In the hadith of Ikram ibn Abdullah ibn, uh, from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhum, it says that the Prophet slept until he could be heard breathing deeply. Then he got up to pray without making wudu. Ikram said that was because he وسلم, was protected. So this is another one of the Prophet's traits وسلم, in another hadith he said that my eyes sleep but my heart does not sleep. So even though the Prophet وسلم, as a man slept his sleep was not like our sleep. Our sleep, even if it's for just a moment, we lose our wudu when we sleep, even if I fall asleep for just one minute. But the Prophet ﷺ was unique in that sense. And he said, my eyes sleep, my heart does not sleep. I spend the evening with my Lord. He provides me with sustenance. So this again was one of his unique qualities. Okay, I'm going to stop here, I think. Yeah, I'm going to stop here because I know that there will be some questions, inshallah.
الله تعالى أعلى وأعلم وصل الله مع سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. Well, there are some questions actually. Um, so someone writes and asks, when the Prophet وسلم, will intercede on our behalf, could the awliya and the pious sheikhs intercede on one's behalf? Yes, there are, in the hadith we know that there are there are many different types of intercession. So the person that memorizes the Quran has intercession, the shaheed has intercession. Yes, so there are people that Allah Ta'ala grants intercession. This is from the, from the hadith literature that we know that. And um, uh, parents, some parents will have intercession. Uh, some children will have intercession for the parents, so on and so forth. So yes, the pious will, uh, will be granted intercession. Of course, the greatest intercession is that of the Prophet ﷺ. When he intercedes on behalf of all of humanity, as we read in the previous class, uh, to have the Yawm Al-Qiyamah start. Uh, and then the Prophet ﷺ will also intercede for the believers, inshallah, so on and so forth. Yes, so the intercession of the Prophet ﷺ is a big, if I'm not mistaken, there's a whole section on it, uh, in the book it's a, it's a larger concept and it's not something that is only revert, reserved for rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam but there are other types of people that will have intercession inshallah was the seal of the prophet in between the shoulders of our prophet from birth or later when he got revelation later when he got revelation so this was not something that he was born with but after the prophet isa sallam's chest was split open and his heart taken out and washed and the portion of the shaitan was removed his heart was placed back in his chest his chest was sewed and then there was the seal of the prophethood was placed in the back sallallahu alaihi wasallam and um yeah so this is not something that he was born with but something that appeared later We also have in the mosque a artistic rendition of that. So that is described in the, the seal in the back of the Prophet's back, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is uh, described in the hadith, in some of the hadith narrations. And in the, in the traditional books, um, the ulama would actually draw it. Uh, so there is a standard image that we have of that. We also have a drawing of that in our mosque. Uh, when we use camphor, when we prepare the body for burial, some scents are also used. Could you comment on camphor? Is there any other alternative when doing the ghusl? Well, the camphor is what comes from the hadith literature, um, a siddr and whatnot. Um, so we, in compliance with the, the it's, it's a very strong scent that it 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 covers any negative sense that might be there from as i said the washing process but it's not too strong that it's like pot you know it's too potent or something when we're when we take the body to the mosque and wash you can use other scents yeah i mean it's that's fine some people they'll have like a little bottle of musk that they'll use um uh, that they you know purchased when they were in hajj and it's very precious to them and they'll tell their children if when i die please you know put this on me and things like that that's fine that's that's okay uh, and you know we want the body to smell good uh, because we're after we wash the body we're going to be with the body for a little bit of time as we do the ghusl and as we take it to the burial and as we you know as we see this is like this is what the prophet sallam smelled like this is what he was like so it's in a way it's it's you can think of it as following the sunnah of the prophet i sallam in the story of aisha sallam being accused of committing zina did the prophet sallam believe her of course he believed her um but he was waiting for her um for her innocence to be declared through revelation and it was also a time of fitna because the people, the, the munafiqun in Medina were the ones spreading the rumors. So the Prophet ﷺ did not want to engage in the rumor mill. And he did not want he, he did not want to have a human intervention in the rumors. 
and he waited until that came through revelation. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course he believed her. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, and that also teaches us a big lesson, by the way, about rumors and, and how to deal with them. And a lot of times people, they want to jump in and like combat the rumors. But a rumor is something that's not real, it's fake. So when you give, when you give it life, then you, you kind of like create like this boogeyman. And the way that the Prophet ﷺ dealt with it is he dealt with it with that which is solid. So, you know, let's say, I don't know, somebody accuses me of, um, say somebody accuses me of, of having false belief or, or not sound belief. Like, oh, this, this imam that you guys have, you know, he doesn't have real belief. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dignify that. Just, just listen to what I say. And, you know, we have hundreds of classes that are recorded and hours with each other. Go back and look at that stuff and see. So you always want to rely on that, which is real and not dignify it with a response. So that's sort of what the prophet was doing. Do we have the image of the seal at ICCP? Yeah, we do. I think it's in the library. Uh, it's in the library. And inshallah, when we have the new activity building built and completed, inshallah, soon, we'll have more, you know, more surface area to, to, to display our artwork and things like that. But alhamdulillah, we have a beautiful mosque and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, you know, always maintain its beauty for us, inshallah. Did the miracles of the Prophet that were present at birth, like him being clean, mean that his prophethood began at birth? Or only when we begin to receive, he began to receive revelation? Oh, it's a very good question. So the Prophet Asasalam's prophecy began when he received revelation at the age of 40. However, the Prophet Asasalam for us, his entirety is an example. Allah Ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Verily in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu is a good example. Some Muslims, they think that the Prophet's life at the end of his life, that's the example. All of the Prophet's life is the example. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there's no abrogation. There's no nesh in the Prophet's seerah. It's not like what happened in his last year erases everything that he did before. So the stuff that he did in Mecca is still an example for us. The way he conducted himself before his Islam and revelation is also an example for us as well. So yes, so the fact that he was born in this way the Prophet is not a hero. A hero could be us. We were born normal. We struggle. We have a, str a normal life. And then we find our guidance and we find our way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we become like an illuminated person. That's not the Prophet. He's a prophet. It's different. He was protected from birth all the way through. He even said of himself that none of the belief of the Jahiliyyah touched him. He never had false belief. He never believed in multiple gods and went through some sort of, you know, crisis of faith and then found God. It's not like that they, at all. The Prophet ﷺ was a monotheist from birth. His parents were monotheists their entire life. His entire lineage was, they were all monotheists and pious people. So that's actually a very important question because it reminds us of this point is that the, the Prophet ﷺ is protected in his entirety from birth, uh, in his entire life. And therefore, all of that for us is an example. It's an example of how we deal with other people in different modes, in different situations, in different circumstances. So it's very, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad the person asked this question because it's an it's a important teaching point for us. Will we be covering the dress and attire of the Prophet? Yes, inshallah. Also, is there reference to the manner that Aisha addressed, alayhi uh, salam? The manner of Sayyidah Aisha, I don't believe, is in this book. But the dress is, uh, it will be here, inshallah. Can't remember exactly what section it's in. It would take me too long to find it. Did people from the other lands witness the splitting of the moon? Yes, there were Arab tribes that were uh, caravans that witnessed it. And then they came uh, to Medina 
and they saw they they mentioned we saw this weird thing that happened a few days ago when we were traveling such and such and and that's so this was something physical this was not like a metaphorical uh, thing and it was witnessed in some in some of the books of um Sira, I think I I can't remember where I read this, but there there is some people reference that it was seen as far as in China. Maybe it was in Shibli Nomani's uh, Encyclopedia of Sira. I can't remember where I read this now, but. Um, some of the ulama claim that in some of the early historical books that the Chinese kept, that that was documented. And I remember there was a time where I was trying to tr track that down and I, I was not very successful. I didn't make, make too much of an effort, but th there are these books of history of China, uh, early history. And apparently in one of those books, and, and it would... Now, now I want to. Now I'm itching to remember where I read this. I I can't. I have to. I need a, I need a day to think about this. But apparently, this has also has also been recorded outside of Arabia. Allah alam. I don't know if that's sound or not, and it it doesn't really add nor subtract uh, to the to the belief of that miracle. Um, but at the time of that miracle, there were other non-Muslim Arabs that saw that and had reported it. Okay, uh, if there are no questions, we can um, we can end here today, inshallah. Next few weeks will we'll also be online, so please don't don't uh, lose steam with me. Uh, and um, I'm just sorting out a few things. I'll I'll, uh, I'll let everyone know when I return soon, inshallah. Um, oh, you mentioned the cleanliness of Japanese. Can you say more? And also the mosque you visited. Actually, I, I, mis I visited many mosques. So I, I visited uh, many mosques in Tokyo. I, mis I visited the mosque in Kobe, which is uh, the first mosque ever built in Japan. I think it was like in the 1920s or something. And then I, I visited, yeah, Kobe. I visited the Kobe mosque and several in, in, in uh, Tokyo. And the, the cleanliness of the Japanese has a lot to do with the Japanese native religion of uh, the Shinto faith uh, and the importance of um, cleanliness that's associated with their belief of the spirits, the kami, they call it the kami way, the kami are, are these deities that the, the, the Shinto faith believes in. And it has a lot to do with preserving those deities' natural environment and the cleanliness around it. So part of the way that they honor those deities is that the shrines that are dedicated to those deities or to those you know, beings, I mean, of course we don't believe in that, but I'm just saying that's what they believe in, it's constantly cleansed. So they're, they're always sweeping it and always keeping it clean, so on and so forth. Um, uh, of course, Buddhism came into Japan uh, by way of Korea, so Japan is is split between its Shinto and its Buddhist faith, but the the Shinto way is the natural religion or is the indigenous faith of the Japanese people. The other thing is that the Japanese people are very, you know, it's a very ancient civilization, and they have an unbroken dynasty or, 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 or their monarchy is an unbroken for like almost 2,000 years or something. So it's, one, it's the oldest monarchy on earth. And because of that, and because of the, the homogeneous belief that they have had unbroken, that has allowed this idea of the cleanliness to seep through all aspects of society. So it's, it's really a testament to the resilience of Japanese culture even through all of the difficulties that they've been through through World War II and you know the bombing of of much of their country, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, the bombing of Tokyo, still they still maintained all of that. And their culture is so strong and resilient that they only accept into their culture that which is compatible, or they make it compatible 
with their beliefs and then they accept it. So if you go to J Japan and places like Tokyo or Kobe or um, uh, Kyoto or these other places, you know, there, there's a lot of, I mean, Tokyo is a very bustling city, but it's very different than the Western bustling cities. There's something different about it. And that's what's different is that they've maintained their belief and their order and the way that they, they build buildings in relation to nature. And a lot of that has to do with their beliefs in the Shinto, in the Shinto way, as I, as I mentioned. Um, they have a premium on nature and the premium on uh, greenery, gardening, um, uh, you know, the idea of perfecting their, their, their tasks. So the idea of like the tea ceremony and, um, you know, the bonsai tree and these type of things that they believe have care, carry spiritual meanings with them. So by perfecting the, the making of tea and the serving of tea, you it's like a type of jihad of the nefs. Uh, and that carries on to how their, 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 their clothing, what they wear, and it's carried into how they maintain their homes and, and so on and so forth. It's very, very fascinating. It's a very, very fascinating um, and, and, and beautiful. The, the Japanese masajid that are mainly Japanese Muslims, like Japanese people, ethnically Japanese people who have converted, they're extremely clean. And then there are our mosques, people that have come to Japan from different parts of the Muslim world. And it's, the, it's, a, it's a mess and the shoes are everywhere. and It's very dirty and, you know, it smells like cooking and stuff like that. So, you know, <laughs> that was very interesting actually to see. But um, yeah, it's, it has a lot to do with the, the, the history of the people and the language and, and whatnot. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and to keep us safe and to protect our family and our parents and our mosque and our schools and our institutions, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to lift us all by the remembrance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May we be uh, closer to him, closer to our faith, uh, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wanan alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallillahum ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. اللهم صل أفضل صلاة على أسعد مخلوقاتك سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم عدد معلوماتك وميداد كلماتك كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكره الغافلون